So when we talk about the magnitude of the earthquakes that occur on a daily basis, we're talking about things that are magnitude two or mm -hmm. something like that. Just a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. Conversely, the earthquakes we tend to care about are the ones that cause the most shaking mm -hmm. and damage. Those tend to be things that are magnitude 6.5 or mm -hmm. larger. In a given year, you might have the occurrence of 20 or so magnitude 7 events across the globe. Oh, wow, I see. And some of those occur in places where people live. Mm -hmm. And people happen to live in a, in a lot of places where earthquakes are common. Greetings, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. We live on a planet where earthquakes are common, and some are devastating, especially given the density of human population today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our guest today, Brendan Mead, is well known for his computer models for earthquake patterns. Dr. Mead is an applied computational scientist and professor of earth and planetary sciences at Harvard University. He's going to explain why the earth is so shaky, the necessity necessity for these models and how scientists develop these models. Dr. Mead, thank you. Welcome and we're so pleased to have you with us. Thanks for having me. Okay, and so now explain everything. Nothing to it, right? <laughs> so the first thing to realize is that earthquakes aren't uncommon. Right. Earthquakes happen every day. There are hundreds every day. But most of them are not events that we pay particular attention to. And the reason for that is that earthquakes come in different sizes. Mm. Most of the earthquakes that are occurring are small earthquakes. We've, prob we've all heard of the magnitude of an mm -hmm. earthquake. So when we talk about the magnitude of the earthquakes that occur on a daily basis, we're talking about things that are magnitude two or mm -hmm. something like that. Just a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. Conversely, the earthquakes we tend to care about are the ones that cause the most shaking mm -hmm. and damage. Those tend to be things that are magnitude 6.5 or mm -hmm. larger. In a given year, you might have the occurrence of 20 or so magnitude 7 events across the globe. Oh, wow, I see. And some of those occur in places where people live. Mm -hmm. And people happen to live in a, in a lot of places where earthquakes are common. And so a lot of those places are coastlines near the boundaries of the major tectonic plates. Places like Japan, places like the west coast of the United States, which have high population densities. They also have incredibly intricate fault networks. Uh -huh. And earthquakes always occur on faults. Okay. Faults are thin cracks or fractures in the earth. They're incredibly thin in many cases. The boundary between the Pacific and North American tectonic plates can be just about as wide as your thumb. Mm -hmm. So these huge tectonic structures, which are 10,000 kilometers across, have these small little breaks between ah. them, and it's on those breaks on which the largest earthquakes occur. Okay, now these tectonic plates, could you give us a little background uh, on that? It took a long time for a lot of scientists yeah. to accept the fact of tectonic plates, but are these things up here on the surface or where? Yeah. And, and what are they? We can think about the Earth broadly as having four major layers. Okay. We live on the uppermost layer. It's the Earth's crust. It's a rocky layer. Uh, it's between 15 and about 70 kilometers thick. Beneath that is another rocky layer. That's the Earth's mantle. It's about 3,000 kilometers thick. Also rocky, but much warmer than mm -hmm. uh, the crust. Beneath that, there's the outer core and the inner core. These are metallic structures uh, that actually don't participate much in the earthquake okay, problem. Yeah. But the Earth's mantle certainly does. Mm -hmm. The Earth's mantle is hot. And because it's hot, it's moving around. It's trying to cool off. Space is cold, the mantle is hot, and so it advects heat around okay. internally. The upper layer of that interfaces with the Earth's crust where we live. It drags around pieces of the crust, and this is plate tectonics. It drags around these cold pieces of crust, and as they move past each other, they don't move past smoothly most of the time. Most of the time, uh, it's rock rubbing against rock. Okay. It gets frictionally stuck together. As it gets frictionally stuck together, the crust itself starts to deform. 
Mm -hmm. It deforms, it stores elastic strain energy as it deforms. Eventually, that stored energy uh, generates a set of stresses on the fault that eventually overcome the frictional resistance of the fault. Okay. When they do, that's an earthquake. Okay. And so what happens in an earthquake is an earthquake releases stored strain energy mm. that's been built up by the plate tectonic process. So the best way to think about most earthquakes is as a byproduct of plate tectonics. They're not magical events that kind of inject energy into the Earth's system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Rather, they release something that's already there. And the Earth's surface is broken up into kind of 15 or so major tectonic plates. These are the ones that were recognized starting in the 1960s and 1970s. Okay. But nowadays we know that there are a myriad of smaller oh, structures. Oh, I see. There are hundreds or thousands of smaller structures and these are the things that give rise to the fact that a plate boundary zone like California, mm -hmm. it has the San Andreas Fault, which we've mm -hmm. all heard of, mm -hmm. but it has tens to hundreds of other faults. And all of these faults exist in this complex network of fractures and little tectonic blocks uh, and plates, which are all jumbled together and grind past each other, driving the earthquake cycle. So when you have a quake, I even a modest-sized one, other th it's hitting other things too, correct? Yeah. That it would be uh, a, a kind of communication. <laughs> Everybody starts shaking at the same time, or so it's all kind of connected. Absolutely. When, yeah. when earthquakes happen, they happen quickly enough that they radiate energy. Yeah. That okay. energy that's radiated are seismic waves. Seismic waves come in a variety of interesting types, okay. ones that travel along the surface, ones that travel oh. through the body of the Earth. The ones that travel along the surface of the Earth do the most damage. They do the most damage because they have very high amplitudes, and they also do the most damage because they move relatively slowly, so they shake places for a longer period uh -huh. of time. But those waves, as they pass along the, through the Earth's surface and through the body of the Earth, they have the opportunity to change the stress on other faults that are nearby. Right, yes, see, And this yes. offers a type of, to use your word, uh, a type of telecommunication mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. fault systems. The, the reality is that this offers the possibility of one earthquake triggering another. The classic form of this is something we're actually pretty familiar with. It's not that exotic. The classic form of this is that you have a large earthquake, mm -hmm. and then you have a series of earthquakes after it. Yes. These are called aftershocks. So an earthquake happens. It changes the orientation and magnitudes of stress in the Earth's crust. Those seismic waves radiate out, mm -hmm. and they're able to trigger aftershock sequences on the fault that ruptured itself and perhaps on and subsidiary over, uh, faults right, as well. Right, I see. So there can be whole cascades of earthquake cycle processes. The longer-term version of this, uh, in terms of, hey, did an earthquake in the year 1980 <laughs> trigger an earthquake in the year 2000? That's something we don't know the answer to yeah, yeah. at this point in time. Because it's all shaking. <laughs> it's all shaking, but we also have a fundamental problem in earthquake science, which is pretty interesting. So the problem we tend to have is this. If you, were, if you wanted to predict um, the stock market or something like that, you have millions and millions of stocks uh, with time series where they have, I don't know, hour by hour for tens or twenties and twenty years. For the things we're most interested in predicting in the earthquake problem, that's large earthquakes, mm -hmm. we don't have time series like that. Mm -hmm. The biggest earthquakes we care about, things like magnitude 9 events, like the Great Japan Earthquake of 2011, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. prior to that earthquake, the last large earthquake in that region was 600 years prior. Yeah, so you can see. So we're not studying a system where we have data that gives us these mm -hmm. beautiful time mm -hmm. series that we can mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. kind of sit and study them in, in the way we would like to. Instead, what we have, and this is one of the reasons why it's such an interesting problem, is we have earthquakes all around the world. Yes. So instead of one beautiful time series, what we have is observations around the world of fault systems that are at different parts in their earthquake cycle. Oh. Uh. And so our job is kind of a different type of science. Right, right. It's not the type of science where you look at that one beautiful time series and say, ah. Instead, we have to develop methods to kind of piece together these kind of little snapshots here, little snapshots yes. here, little snapshot there, in places that are geologically different, and somehow develop theories that are meaningful across all of these systems. Yes.
two things on this. First, I want to ask you about some of these massive earthquakes yeah. that seem to have taken, I think, in this past year in different places. But I want to get on that yeah. cycle business yeah. and then how you do this. But we had, I think, in this past year, they're not like next door neighbors, yeah. but uh, let's see, Afghanistan, uh, did we have one in, let's see. Uh, I'm thinking Morocco was horrible. The Turkey, Turkey, Sy Turkey, Turkey was Syria. horrific. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Afghanistan, Nepal. Yeah. Uh, so there were, there were like four or five, yeah. and they were big yeah. and horrific. Are those part of this, not cycle, but yeah. you, you... In terms of the telecommunications between earthquakes, yeah. I don't... I don't know that we have a cogent argument that these yeah, events are okay, linked, linked right, in any way. Okay. However, I think we have good arguments that in most of those cases, particularly in the Turkey-Syria case yeah. uh, and in the, in the Nepal case, that we really knew that these are places that are ready to have earthquakes. I'll say you knew, you can sort of say, keep an eye out here. No one's surprised right. about events yes. like this. Or Not no one geologists. Should be, no anybody. one should be surprised. <laughs> yes. When I explained um, that earthquakes are a byproduct of strain accumulation, yes. one of the most remarkable things that's happened in the past 30 years is that while we don't have prediction like er an earthquake's going to, have to happen tomorrow, one of the things we do have now is we have the ability to monitor and measure the process of elastic strain accumulation. Ah, I see. That, that, that. So when you think about the data for an earthquake, I bet everyone thinks about the same type of thing. You think about a seismic signal. Exactly. Which they exactly. show on the news right. and show in the exactly. movies. Exactly. Start shaking exactly. like that. That is a measure of fast deformation in the Earth. That's when the Earth's shaking like you're mm -hmm. shaking a mm -hmm. table mm -hmm. right now. But most of the time, the Earth's not moving that fast. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, the Earth is moving at plate tectonic rates. I These are rates of centimeters to millimeters to tenth of a millimeter per year. So think about the rate at which your fingernails grow. Exactly, struck. exactly. That's very, very slow. And the classic thing, kind of seismometers, they can't measure that. But we have technologies that can now, and it's technology you're all pretty familiar with. It's geodetic data. Now that okay, may sound yeah, really well, strange, right, right. but the primary type of geodetic data that we use is GPS. Mm -hmm. If you're walking somewhere and you want to meet your friend at some location, you take out your phone and you open your Maps app and it shows you as a blue dot. Right? That blue dot is where, where you're located. That's determined because your phone is listening to GPS satellites. Mm -hmm. These GPS there, satellites are 20, very precise. And they're 20,000 kilometers mm -hmm. above the Earth's surface, mm -hmm. super high altitude. They're one eighth of the way to the moon. Mm -hmm. And with those, you can figure out which side of the street you're on. But oftentimes, it's hard to do better than which side of the street you're on. Mm -hmm. However, there is a really kind of technical way to process the data at high frequency and at high resolution that enables us to not only figure out which street you're on, but to measure with a precision that as, is at sub-millimeter per that year precision. That is amazing. And, and you can do this with the earthquakes. This is the geodetic yep. uh, approach that I see. So we now have geodetic monitoring networks across large swaths of the Earth. Uh, the United States has an amazing network, um, particularly in the western uh, United States. Japan has a monitoring network of approximately 1,200 continuously recording GPS mm. stations. Um, you can f all uh, Are all they looking below the surface? Uh, they're able to, uh, yeah. The way they work is that they're drilled into the bedrock. Oh, oh, I see. And so what so these things right. do is they're, they're they measure how the bedrock moves. Right. Now we would love to be able to go down to the depths at which earthquakes <laughs> start, 10 or 15 kilometers and do that, but in general we can't. Mm -hmm. In general we have observations of mm -hmm. the Earth's mm -hmm. surface. Mm -hmm. And so what we have now is pretty remarkable. In many places on Earth we have observations of how the Earth is moving in between earthquakes. Let me say it another way. Mm -hmm. That's an observation of how the Earth's getting ready to have its yes. next earthquake. Yes, and that's why you guys know people ought to pay attention here. Yeah, so one of the things we're able to do is we're able to identify the locations where strain is accumulating most mm -hmm. quickly. Mm -hmm. Now, 
we know uh, that places like Nepal, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. we know that places like um, Turkey and Turkey. Syria, there's a major tectonic structure uh, there where the Dead Sea Fault, as it runs north, um, it kind of turns uh, over to the northeast and becomes what's called the East Anatolian Fault. Um, these faults are so well known they have names. Mm -hmm, uh, like mm -hmm. nobody is and addresses, yeah. right? <laughs> you can download maps of them. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, They're not mm -hmm. surprises. And so uh, we knew about that fault. Um, there had been very little work done on it in terms of mm, exactly kind of how, where it was in its earthquake cycle. Um, but now people are certainly turning their attention, not just to the event that's happened, but to the question of what about the regions adjacent mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to where that I event guess, happened? Yes. Where are they in their earthquake cycles? Right. And there is geodetic data there that people are currently using today to try and figure out where those parts of the fault are in their earthquake cycle. Now, there are two things. I'm going to get yeah. to this earthquake cycles, too. But in terms of these huge earthquakes that have happened in this past year, and I have mentioned that there was a lot of alarm in the geology yeah. uh, 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 community about about an upcoming Turkey uh, mm. uh, uh, earthquake, and uh, apparently officials were not paying attention to mm. that. But you know, now we understand from what you're explaining, you, you can get an idea that something's happening here, look out. So we certainly don't want to go that far. Yeah, what we well you can't predict when, right. Right, so one of the things we can do is we can cogently figure out which faults are, or which regions, are building up elastic strain energy okay. today. We cannot say that it's been constant in time because yes. we've only had GPS for a handful yes, of years. Yes. It could be highly variable in time. Uh, okay. So we don't know if it's been going on for 10 years. We don't know if it's been going on for 10,000 years. The time history is again not something we have access to. You're sure. So uh, scientists are certainly not in a position where we're able to say uh, this is going to happen tomorrow, in the next right. month, or the next year. Right. But there's a range of things that our people are trying to do now. We're trying to take these observations of how the Earth's surface is moving and turn those into images of what's actually happening on the faults at depth. Uh -oh. So we're taking what we uh -oh. have at the surface and we're trying to turn that into a picture of what each fault is doing. Not just the fault is moving, but an actual image of what parts of the fault are stuck together and what parts of the fault might be sliding past each other. Parts that are stuck together, well, those are the parts that are accumulating strain energy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The parts that are sliding past each other, well, they're sliding. Um, that's what I like to call kind of the only good news yeah, right. in, 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 in earthquake science. <laughs> right. It doesn't mean they're not capable of having an earthquake. Right, right, right. But they're not actively accumulating strain energy today. And so a lot of the work that's done nowadays is to take these surface observations and turn them into snapshots of what individual faults are doing in time. Now that information is useful, but it doesn't give us a time history. Yeah, right, 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 right. So there are whole suites of other things that people try to do. People try to build statistical models of fault systems. People try to actually build in the computer representations of all the physics that are in a fault system and then run these things for hundreds of thousands or millions of years. And the purpose of doing that is not just to explain the physics of how these faults work, but also to understand for a given fault, like the East Anatolian Fault, yeah. How frequently would you expect it to have earthquakes mm -hmm. of a given size, type, and at a specific location? If we're not going to ha ever have access to the time history of this, we have to turn to the computer to try to simulate and model these things to develop representations that give us things like the frequency of these events. Right. So I think this is where you come in with, with certain networks, like neural networks. Do you use these different types of modeling? Uh, and can you tell us some more about that? Does that uh, help you understand like the, I don't know, I hate to say deep time on this, but uh, time in a much greater sense than like three weeks from now or something like that? Yeah, so there are really three prominent approaches um, to trying to say something about where earthquakes will occur, how large they'll mm -hmm, be, mm -hmm. and when they'll be. And, yeah. Those are the three things mm -hmm, we want to know. Mm -hmm. If we can do that, we're, we're having a good day. By and large, we have some idea about where earthquakes are going to be. They tend to be on faults that are right. well mapped. 
that information is nowadays augmented with how stuck together is the fault. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're, we're able to augment that. In terms of how big they're going to be, larger faults often tend to have larger earthquakes. Mm -hmm. um, there's more area available. That's, that's a pretty simple one. In terms of when they're going to be, we cannot say much that is very cogent. But nonetheless, there are three approaches to all mm -hmm, three parts mm -hmm, of this mm -hmm, prediction. Mm -hmm. One is to build into the computer a computational representation of all the physics and all the geometry that you have and run that system forward in time. Okay. That's the approach that I just okay. discussed. You try to build a physics-based mechanical model of things. This is a computationally challenging and interesting problem. I bet. Yeah. Um, it also requires vast computer resources. Doing it at a scale that we want um, is inaccessible uh, to us. There just simply aren't computers that are large enough uh, to, to do it. Uh, very similar to modeling the atmosphere. Right. Uh, there yes. simply aren't right. computers that have right. to be done. So compromises have to be made. Another approach is to say, look, what if I can say something about what's going on in the system without having to know all the physics? Now, that sounds a little crazy, but it's actually what statisticians do for a living. Hmm. We say, what are the statistical properties of earthquakes here? And then, how do those statistical properties propagate in time? St statistical approaches to the earthquake forecasting problem have been around for a long time, since the mid-70s. And some of them are actually pretty OK. Um, one of the best prediction models, it's called the ETAS model, E-T-A-S. Um, it has been developed, it had its origin in the 1970s, it developed in earnest in the 1980s, and it's actively used for earthquake forecasting okay. in some parts of the world today. Now, those models tend to build in a lot of humans' best guesses about kind of the statistics of fault systems. What's happened over the past five or so years is we've seen the beginnings of the machine learning artificial intelligence mm -hmm, revolution mm -hmm. starting to propagate into this field. And that's the third path to mm -hmm, forecasting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It has elements of statistical uh, forecasting in it. Sometimes people include elements of the mechanics uh, of the system as well. The key idea here is that we're, those approaches look to essentially minimize the role of the human in assuming what the statistics ought it to look like. It sort of like. picks it out by itself. Exactly. Uh, so it's much more purely data driven. Mm -hmm. And so there are approaches to machine learning approaches uh, that have been used to identify in California the existence of foreshock sequences, that is earthquake sequ earthquakes before uh, large uh, earthquakes. Uh, more and more foreshock sequences have been identified. So this is what, some trembling uh, like a head, well ahead of? of Hours. Uh, Hours, yep. not days, weeks, months, or anything like that. Yep. Okay. Um, and these are, for, these are very small earthquakes. Yes, I and understand. And it's only in some, some cases. And more and more foreshock sequences are being identified. The challenge with that is that they're still non-diagnostic. They occur once in a while. Yes. Before a large earthquake. Oh, oh, oh I but see. Not very frequently I before see. large earthquakes. So it's not a necessary part of the. Oh, okay. At least not that we know. In, yeah. <laughs> right. Nonetheless, this is a machine learning enabled discovery uh, that's being made. And there's a great opening. Uh, because of this ability to discover, there's a great opening in thinking. Um, kind of the, I don't want to say confidence, but the, uh, the classical foundation, mm -hmm, perhaps, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that we might have that we might have thought of 30 years ago is opening up now in a way it hasn't in quite some time. And so there are new ideas coming in. Right. There are and old revisions and old ideas that people were like, nah, that's, right. that's not a thing. People are coming back to these now and it's becoming, uh, it's becoming vibrant. Uh, it's becoming, uh, qu quite frankly, you know, it's a very difficult field to study. Yeah, I can. Because you're studying something that in general, when it's in the news, it's horrible. Right, right. You know? But it's also so dynamic and uh, it is, and, and complex. And I think we're at a time now where um, I don't know what the future holds, but I think there is an opening of thinking here. And that's, uh, I don't know if it'll be fruitful in terms of providing hazard, better hazard assessment. Um, but I do know 
uh, that there is an embrace of kind of the complex systems thinking. There is an embrace that new ideas or old ideas need to be revisited now. Right. And so we're seeing That's where that goes. That's science, classically, because you realize, uh-oh, that was all wrong. Throw it out. Start over again. Or you discover something, and then you have to quarrel about how good it is or whatever. I, I but always, how interesting. Um, um, in, on this, you mentioned the geodetic yeah. uh, 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 possibility, uh, I should say, that 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 framework that gives you a certain kind of data and then you have other kind sources of yeah. data you put all of this into machines because this can work much more broadly than the human brain yeah. and again you can look at that um, what are your best like indicators so you mentioned the yeah. geodetic uh, are there other things that you use that give you give you the data. Yeah. So then you have the way of computing. So right now, kind of the the idea that you suggested, which is a great one, kind of the let's throw in all the data and see if we can use machine learning techniques to predict earthquakes. That's not really being done right now. There's no group that's actively doing that. Okay. Um, I think people should. I think it would be a great that idea. That or else they know better and <laughs> to throw stuff <laughs> out to begin with. So obviously there's that. But So the classic form of earthquake prediction is actually pretty strange. The classic form of earthquake prediction is to take a history of past earthquakes <laughs> and predict future earthquakes from it. But. <laughs> so people <laughs> traditionally try to do earthquake to earthquake prediction. One of the ideas that's emerged over the past five years that came out of laboratory work that's been done is that instead of trying to do earthquake to earthquake prediction, one of the things you might want to do is seismic waveform to earthquake prediction. So remember I mentioned seismic waves, and we know they shake a lot. The seismometers shake a lot when big earthquake waves um, come through. But they're shaking all the time, too, at very small levels. That could be to foreshocks. Um, that could be to just background radiation in, uh, in the Earth. Laboratory work has suggested that we're, and by laboratory work, I mean people taking small samples of rocks in the laboratory and sliding them past each other. They put these oh. little, little acoustic things on them. If they do that, there are things that emerge in the little waveforms that you could not pick out with your eye. You could not pick out with your eye, but machine learning techniques are saying, hey, there's an impending Very slip event. Very interesting, yeah, yeah. So now one of the things that's emerging is the idea of not doing earthquake to earthquake prediction, but doing seismic waveform to earthquake prediction. But there are a whole suite of other things that okay. may be considered too. One of the things that's uh, anything that modulates the level of force or stress in the crust could be considered a potential trigger, uh, a potential oh, causal agent okay. for earthquakes. Okay. The stresses involved in earthquakes, you might think that the change in stress that's been posited to trigger an earthquake is some gargantuan number because it's deep inside the earth. Not so. Uh -huh. The stresses that are purported to trigger earthquakes are astonishingly small. They're close to just resting your finger on this table small. So, if you think about that, the magnitude of stresses that are commonly assumed to be, to have the potential to trigger earthquakes yeah, yeah. are not these gargantuan stress How changes. How very interesting. They're very, very small. And so there's a whole range of things <laughs> uh, that can cause stress changes that are of this magnitude. And so this is one of the real challenges that exists in earthquake science, because if it is the case that we understand the physics and that the magnitude of stress change is relatively small that could cause an earthquake, one of the questions that emerges is, why doesn't everything yeah, <laughs> right. tr trigger an earthquake? Right, right. And so this is not a place where we have answers. This okay. is a place of active research. Right. Where we're trying to figure out, is this a physics problem? Is this a data problem? And we don't know. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. We're unfortunate. I wanted to ask a few more things on there, but at least we understand that it's complex. There are a number yeah. of things that lead to the earthquake, uh, that can lead to an absolutely. earthquake. You can't predict it, uh, uh, absolutely. And I wish we could talk more about the modeling because sure. that is a really exciting area. Fantastic. And we are told now that we need to move to the questions. And so I will, uh, uh, if you'd like. Um, oh, 
Uh, the, someone has asked about the subduction fault off of Oregon, yeah. and perhaps you could explain subduction sure. as well. It's hard to do without pictures, but you can. I've got hands. <laughs> okay. So, the west coast of the United States is prone to earthquakes. Most people know about the San Andreas Fault. Um, that hasn't had a large earthquake in a long time, but it's not the only seismic hazard in the western mm -hmm. United States. Moving north to northern California, Oregon, and Washington mm -hmm. State, and southern British Columbia, there, off the coast, there's something called a subduction zone. This is a place where a piece of oceanic crust, this oceanic crust is sinking down beneath the continent. Mm -hmm, that mm -hmm, process mm -hmm. of oceanic crust sinking beneath continental crust is called subduction. And as you might imagine, the interface between the oceanic crust and the continental crust sitting above it is a rough and, you know, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. frictionally, uh, well, frictional interface. So that is what's called the Cascadia subduction zone. It is a place where geodetic imaging has revealed that large parts of it are stuck together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It is a place where there has not been a large earthquake in a long time, in excess of, well, in approximately 400 years. And they keep waiting, don't they? Yes. So it is a place that is actively being loaded today in terms of accumulating strain energy. It is a place that has a large history of earthquakes, a long history of earthquakes that have been revealed through looking at various geological markers on the ground. Um, one of the ways that people also know uh, about um, Cascadia earthquakes is because they generate tsunamis. And some of those tsunamis have actually propagated across the entire Pacific Ocean. And there are records of them recorded in Japan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so those records, some of the records of tsunamis in Japan note that there were earthquakes in, pardon me, that there were tsunamis in Japan, but no earthquakes. Right. And so this is one of the ways that we know about the time history there. Just very quickly, has that happened in reverse too, that we, there was an earthquake in Japan and then we have a tsunami on the west coast of, the, of North America? Has that happened too? I thought there was a geological record that there was no earthquake here, but there was this tsunami. There certainly, there yeah. cer there certainly could be. I don't yeah. know about it being yeah. written, written down, but okay. there certainly could but be. That so the entire apart. Pacific Northwest, uh, mm -hmm. at least on the coastal side, is uh, seismically exposed. We also know um, that the, there's a high probability, uh, based on how the fault is being loaded today and how, uh, what's happened in the past, that tsunamis could be generated as well. Mm -hmm, so there's mm -hmm, not just mm -hmm. a shaking hazard, there's a tsunami ha hazard there okay. as well. Great, okay. And here's another one. Um, the number and magnitude of earthquakes annually remain stable, or can you tell that? Or are they uh, changes? Are there changes uh, to this annual pattern? So right now, kind of, if we're interested in the largest earthquakes, the one that mm -hmm, caused, mm -hmm. caused the most uh, damage, um, we don't have anything super great to say about it because our time history of earthquakes the, isn't, isn't the, very wonderful. That, I was going to say like Turkey and the, the, these areas that are so vulnerable and they do go back in history but they you can't really say like uh, yeah, they're increasing right now. Or, we don't have any deep statement that, that can be made about that. One of the things that is interesting is that in certain places, um, certain places like northern Honshu in, J in Japan, there seems to be some seasonality to oh. small-scale earthquakes. Oh. And that seasonality has been interpreted as um, when snow falls in certain regions, that loads the Earth's crust elastically, changes the stresses on fault, and can change the rate of small earthquake occurrence. That you mentioned you, all you have to do yeah. is put your finger on the, <laughs> on the so surface here. It's like that. People have made arguments for that uh, in northern Japan, and people have made similar arguments um, associated with the hydrological cycle um, in Nepal. Ah, uh, very interesting. And also uh, the, these changes like big melts right yeah. now, does, could be, which would increase pressure in areas. Is that a possibility too? Is, you know, uh, there like, was like glacial stuff. There was wonderful work uh, done by Karen Luttrell, who's a professor at Louisiana State University. Um, and she spent a lot of time looking at the few places where we have long records of earthquakes that go back thousands of years and trying to associate changes in lake levels mm. and changes, small amounts that's of sea simple. level change. And so there is some work on that that's very deeply interesting. Um, the challenge we have, again, is is there a geological record that goes back deep enough in time mm -hmm. for us to do this in a, a meaningful way? Mm -hmm. The best earthquake records that we have 
Uh, most of them only go back about 5,000 years. Okay. To go back through a full glacial interglacial cycle, you need 40,000 years, and we simply don't have records. Right, uh, that, that right. Like that. And you don't have the, the geological equipment to look at the earth in layers and that sort of thing. In, in some areas, you, you can look at the layers and yep. determine things. I don't know if they can determine earthquake. They actually uh, can. There, uh -huh. there are people who go into the field. There's a field called paleo seismology, mm -hmm. and they will dig trenches across faults and look at these layers. And they can go in and they can say, uh -huh. ah, I see this disturbance here, I see this yeah, fracture yeah, was yeah. filled in, and they can date all those things. And the places where they can do that the best, they go back maybe 3,000 to 5,000 years. Yes, that's not, an, that's yeah. not geological time, is not, it right? That's not geological there. time. Okay, and can anything we learn from earthquakes uh, uh, be applied to I don't think I understand spreading, like Iceland, be applied mm. to convergent margin yeah. uh, it, uh, earthquakes. So there are three major types of plate boundaries on Earth. There are convergent margins. These are generally subduction zones. There are transformer strike slip margins. These are places where things slide past each other. California, East Anatolian yeah, Fault yeah, are in that right. cover. Then there are divergent margins. These are where things are pulled apart from one another. The most common type of divergent margin is at the center of the oceans. These are the mid-ocean ridges. Yeah. Okay. One of the places where mid-ocean ridge behavior is manifest on land that people live on is Iceland. Mm -hmm. So Iceland is a location where the North American plate and the Eurasian plate are splitting apart. Mm -hmm. So um, it's seismically active. Uh, there are faults there that you can kind of walk. Can you can yeah. walk up to them yeah, and, yeah. and monitor them. And while there certainly are differences in kind of potential earthquake magnitudes and stuff and things like that, I think there's no reason not to observe every part of the Earth in the hopes of developing unified representations of earthquakes across the globe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, you've got a lot of work to do. I yes. do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need a bigger brain. Right. Really, really There's do. another question here yeah. about that, the aftershocks yeah. many years later, decades and decades later and stuff, and we did talk about yeah. that before, but do you want to just mention that again, whether yeah. we are, whether these things happen, uh, the aftershocks can be felt yeah. many years later? So there is this notion that there's a main shock and it's followed by a series mm -hmm, of aftershocks. Mm -hmm. There's another notion which is that all earthquakes just c exist on a spectrum of earthquake and that there's nothing particularly special about aftershocks or any other, any other type of earthquake. However, within the context of aftershocks, following an earthquake, they are most frequent. Then their frequency decays in time. So the rate at which their frequency decays is dependent on all uh, parameters, to including how large the earthquake was, mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the exact mm -hmm. rocks Where? that it was in, <laughs> th and things like that. In general, the decay is fast. It's mathematically, it's one over time, so it decays pretty quickly. But there are places kind of in the vicinity of the great 1960 Chile earthquake, the Concepcion earthquake, that have exhibited what might be interpreted by some as aftershocks for decades uh, after the event. There's another way of thinking, uh, which is that you know, it's unclear how to classify things as aftershocks in general versus Especially brand. Especially if you have shocks all, I mean, uh, shaking yeah. all the time, right? So um, it's one of the emerging ideas is that uh, do we need these distinctions between mm -hmm. a foreshock, a main shock, and mm -hmm, an aftershock mm -hmm, anymore? Mm -hmm. or are those and little shocks. Be, and <laughs> are these going to be vestiges of something yeah, right, right, previous, right, right. previous yeah, point of view? Yeah. Right, right. Uh, and then one more thing, can an earthquake cause a volcano to erupt? Uh, I would say vice versa, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, like they're anticipating a volcanic, a volcanic eruption that will, might trigger earthquake and it's, so on. Do, are they it's certainly clear that the waves generated by earthquakes propagate through the earth. In some cases they can trigger other earthquakes. and. This has been well observed in places where there are a lot of fluids in the Earth's crust mm. and geothermal fields. Mm -hmm. So there are certain geothermal fields in California that show bursts of seismicity following large earthquakes elsewhere in, Cali in California. So there certainly are connections between fluids in the Earth and, um, 
and the radiation due to, due to earthquakes, the exact extent to which it might trigger a volcano is is is, um, is less certain to me. Okay, uh, but when you have a volcano, yeah. a, a, a huge volcanic eruption, does that tend to cause earthquakes? Or again, you don't really have a way of so, of connecting these. So there is somewhat of a distinction that can be made between volcano earthquakes and tectonic earthquakes. Oh, I see. So as magma inside a volcano moves, mm -hmm. it exerts mm -hmm. forces mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on the plumbing system inside the volcano. And all sorts of, that radiates all sorts of energy and triggers sorts of small earthquakes. So people study volcanic earthquakes a lot and they can actually use that information uh, to figure out how magma is moving oh, inside yes. of a volcano. Yeah. Um, but whether or not a volcanic eruption might trigger a large tectonic earthquake, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of that connection. Um, in, right, in right, way, but right. I don't right, know what the future right, holds. Right, right, right. I wish that we could talk more about the modeling. Before we close off, yeah. I'd like to ask very quickly about what is called these cycles. Uh, uh, what is that, the earthquake cycles? Is there anything important at all? Yeah, the basic idea is that uh, if we circle back to kind of where we started, earthquakes happen for a reason. Earthquakes happen because the Earth has stored up this elastic strain energy mm -hmm. and then it eventually gets released. The idea that there is this slow loading followed by the release of energy, that is the foundational idea behind it, what's called an earthquake cycle. Mm -hmm. We do not mean to imply that there's some regular behavior right, here right, at all. Right, 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 right. Think about it as but something that's... But it's just a vulnerable area, right. Yeah, and so the earthquake cycle in general, we think about as uh, the combination of slow loading and fast unloading in very complex interactive systems. Uh, but that forms the fundamental idea that there are kind of these two stages that are related uh, mathematically, but one is fast and one is slow. Okay, I appreciate that very much, yeah. that, and thank you for answering these questions. The, uh, we leave this with, gosh, it's really complex. Yes. <laughs> and the second thing, and I wish we could have spent more time on it, is that these models yeah. are gonna tell a lot. They're gonna, in the end, when, because you can do so much more computationally, you yeah. can put all all this information in, you learn as you're going, and it reveals information maybe you didn't expect, is that true? I think that's a hope. Um, uh, right now, I think the, we are still in very early days. I know, good just. Um, we don't know what tomorrow holds, and we certainly don't know what five years from now holds. Um, but there is the prospect of doing new and different things. There mm -hmm. is also the prospect of reaching certain, I would say, kind of hopefully thresholds where we have been making a lot of approximations and maybe we get enough computational power or come up with better mathematical parameterizations so that we cross some of these thresholds mm -hmm, and we're including mm -hmm, what mm -hmm, we really mm -hmm, want to mm -hmm. include. Um, and that's one of the things that's really important. The earthquake science problem uh, in general is so much more than earthquakes. It is an applied ah. mathematics problem. It is yeah. a computer science Beautiful. problem. It is a statistics problem. A physics and problem, a chemistry problem. Yeah, there <laughs> anything is, you want. It is not it is not just look at a rock problem. Yes. Uh, there's so so much to it. And I think that's where we may see the breakthroughs in the future. Yes, how very interesting. I hope that is attractive to young students looking yeah. at this field because you, you would be looking at so much yeah. and, and uh, very challenging. Yeah. Dr. Mead, thank you so much. This was most interesting. Thank Thanks. you, Sue.